All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the Maximizing Your Furrow session. My name is Corey Mulbauer. I'm the agronomy lead for the R&D department here at Precision Planting. And uh, Bryce Baker is, is my co-speaker. He's going to come in for the second half of this session. And combined, we're going we're gonna to try to enlighten some new thought and hopefully uh, realign you with, with what it means to maximize the furrow. Um, online, we've also got uh, Fargo, North Dakota. We've got Fort Wayne, Indiana, Lincoln, Nebraska, and London, Ontario also listening in. We've got a very large group in-house today. Welcome all of you that are on the other end of the camera there. Uh, hopefully, in this session, um, we can get your thought process dialed in to kind of the way we think here at Precision Planning. And the way it starts out is, is in that seed furrow, like I said. The potential starts there. When the seed hits the bottom of the furrow, it immediately begins an interaction with the soil. And that soil, if you think of it as a tool on your farm, it's your MVP. It's your most valuable tool that you have because the soil is where the majority of all of your nutrients, all of your water enters into that plant and gives it life and gives it what it needs to grow and produce at its maximum level. So I think it's very important to understand what that soil is built from. How did the soil create what it has for nutrient and water holding capacity? What does it mean to the plant to be interacting with different types of soil, different levels of organic matter? So we're going to go through some fundamental education, and then we're going to get into some of the test plots and trial results that, that I'm involved with. So starting with the soil fundamentals. In a teaspoon of soil, think of that volume of soil, if the soil in that teaspoon is sand and you add up the surface area of all the sand particles, you would equal the surface area of the work boot that you guys walked in, in on today. If that soil in that teaspoon was silt or a loam, and you add up the surface area of that, you would equal about the surface area of the bed of your John Deere Gator or, or whatever brand of side-by-side -side utility vehicle that you have on the farm. If that was all clay in that teaspoon, and you added up the surface area of those clay particles, it would equal the size of an Iowa State Cyclone football field. I just want to note that this is really the only football field that works for me in this demonstration. That's, it's very important to make that note. So anyway, think about the power of the surface area that the roots are interacting with there and the nutrients in the water are interacting with when it's clay versus silt versus sands in your soil types that you have on the farm. This all adds up to the storage capacity for water and nutrients. We refer to this as the cation exchange capacity. So all those soil particles have negative charges, kind of like the positive and negative ends of, of a magnet or a battery. So those negative charges attract positive charges. And the positive charge elements, which are some of the key nutrients that, that we need for our plants, they're, they're tied to those soils. And there's also negative charges in organic matter. And there's also nutrients stored in organic matter in organic form. And all of these things add up to the total capacity for nutrients and water in the soils themselves. So when we think about water, Water, also impacted by that cation exchange capacity, changes its availability and its total capacity by the soil types. This chart is showing you that from the left in the sandy soils to the right in the clay soils, there's a difference in the ability of the soil to hold and retain water. There's also a difference in, in that soil's ability to have available water for the plant's root system. And you notice that that blue zone there, where it's, where it's labeled available water, is the largest in the loam and silt soil zone in the middle. That's because it's this perfect balance of pore space and negative charge sites where there's a maximum amount of storage capacity but also maximum amount of availability of water. When you get over to the pure clay, it's got such a large surface area and so many negative attachment sites that it actually struggles to release the nutrients or the water um, that it has stored in that clay. Organic matter is a key element. Organic matter in our soil is the sponge and the glue that's in between all of those soil particles, and it significantly enhances the capability to store water and to store nutrients and to make those nutrients available to the plant. Organic matter's positive increase or influence in the soil has to do with increasing the porosity, the infiltration rate, the water use efficiency, the nutrient use efficiency is all greater with, with higher organic matter levels in our soil types. The aggregation is better with organic matter. That's the crumb structure and the loose soil particles um, that help it 
uh, uh, better, better handle things like tillage and compaction and that sort of stuff. So it also decreases compaction, decreases the crusting that we worry about after planting in some regions and some of our soil types, decreases runoff and erosion. All of these things are improved when we've got higher organic matter soil zones versus lower organic matter soil zones. The impact on water is a really big one. And it's good if we all understand how much water plays a role in the potential that we have in each one of the different types of soil zones on our farms. This is an example that we ran in the lab just, just last week just to build this demonstration for you to see. So we've got a 10% organic matter loam soil that came from a bottom in a field just 15 miles west of here. It's a field that we do research in. And up on the hill in that same field, there's a 1.5% organic matter sandy loam in that field. And so what we're doing is, is my helpers have a couple of containers with holes drilled in the bottom, and we're simulating a pretty rapid rainfall rate, same amount of volume of water on top of each of these soil samples. And the tube coming out of the side is the runoff. It's the water that's unable to be absorbed or retained by that soil sample. And you can see the graduated cylinder is, is capturing that runoff. And there's a significant difference in the ability of infiltration rate and capacity of each one of these soil types. And you can see how much power there is with organic matter. In fact, you might have thought that a sandy soil has a greater ability to take in water than a, than a clay or a loam soil. But it's actually the opposite. You see those negative charges that are on those soil particles actually pulls water into the soil. The organic matter gives it more room to move and also helps absorb and pull through its sponge-like properties. So there's a significant improvement in the water infiltration and storage capability. And you see the numbers on the screen there. For every 1% greater organic matter level that you have in a soil type, that's about 25,000 gallons more water that's retained and available for your crop during a, during a season. So here's some calculations on, on what that could mean in a field. So this is a typical field. It's a mock field that I put together that would look a lot like the zones that would be here in central Illinois. So we've got a low, for, uh, low OM zone at 1.3%, got a medium zone at 2.4%, and then we've got a high OM zone at 3.7%. The average rainfall here in Illinois during the crop season is about 24 inches of water. That's a 30-year average. The infiltration rate difference of each of these zones is different, just like the demonstration we just watched. So the 1.3% organic matter zone can handle about one and a half inches per hour of rainfall in absorption. Anything above that is gonna run off of that zone. The medium zone is three inches per hour. The high organic matter zone is five inches per hour. And so if we look at <clears throat> the typical rainfall events that we receive here in central Illinois, only about 47% of the rain is able to be absorbed by that 1.3% organic matter zone but as much as 90% of the rain events are able to be absorbed by the higher organic matter zone in this field. So that comes to a total usable rainwater in the season of 11.4 inches on the low OM zone and up to 21.8 inches on that higher organic matter zone. And you can start to think about how is this going to impact the ability for, for consistent high yields from one zone to the next as you think about the different weather patterns you deal with in the season. Some water comes up deep from deeper in the soil, the groundwater that can be added to the usable available water. And then we end up with a total of 19 inches of usable water on the low OM zone and as high as 31.8 inches of usable water in the higher organic matter zone in this example. Well, did you know that there, it's a fact that it's roughly 3,000 gallons of water per bushel to produce corn? So if we consider it takes 3,000 gallons of water to produce a bushel of corn, if water was the primary limiting factor for the yield potential in each one of these zones, you'd be able to raise 175 bushel corn on the 1.3% organic matter soil, 250 bushels about in the medium, and about 287 bushel per acre on the high organic matter zone. So the water retention and water availability difference by organic matter and soil zone in your field is one of the primary factors that creates the yield that you can expect in those different zones. How did the organic matter get there? Did it just show up yesterday? Did we build it over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years that we've been farming that field ourselves? 
No, it's a very, very, very long-term process. It's a result of, of a lot of historic things that have happened in that spot. So we're going to look at, across the entire country, what are some factors that influence the organic matter levels that we have in our regions. So I'm going to use the time frame at which we're t discussing here. We'll just call it out as, say, a 1,000 years. Nobody really knows how long it's taken to form the soils that we have in our areas. So we'll just say over a thousand years. What's happened over a thousand years is we've had different deposits of the parent material, the structural material that makes up the soil that we have. On the left, you see the deposits of lust soils around the country. And this is wind-blown deposits of silts and loams that, that built up on top of whatever was there before. And these are very porous, very forgiving, good productive soils. And then on the right-hand side, you see the glacial till zone. And that's where the glaciers move down from the north, and it significantly influenced what we have for parent material in our soils in those zones. And keep those zones in your memory as we walk through this. The other thing that impacts organic matter in our soils is the long-term climate and vegetation, historical vegetation that occurred in the region that you farm in. So if you look at the colors on this map of the United States, the light blue on the left is representing short bunch grasses, the natural prairie that was there over the last thousand years was short grasses and, and, and it didn't grow a high amount of tonnage or vegetation. As you move to the very dark blue, that represents the zone that had very tall prairie grasses year after year and created a lot of biomass for a thousand years. The red zone out to the east, that was all forest. You see, it's key in building organic matter or creating organic matter over a long period of time. What's the tonnage of carbon biomass material that's being recycled on an annual basis in the soil to allow the microbes to break it down and convert it into the organic matter that's between the soil particles. Where's all the carbon and biomass in a forest? It's above ground. How old is that tree? 100 years, 200 years, 500 year old tree? All of the carbon that that tree has accumulated over that 200 or 500 years is kept above ground and it's never cycled back in the soil for, for reproduction of organic matter or building of organic matter. So then the climate. Out west it's very dry and as you move east in the United States the annual rainfall average starts to increase. The temperatures in the United States, cooler to the north and warmer to the south, temperature has a lot to do with organic matter. You see if you're warm year-round it's very hard to have organic matter built up in your area because the carbon never stops burning. The microbes never stop. So the biomass that you cycle in the soil is consumed at a much higher rate than what it is up north where we shut that system down for half the year. So the result of a thousand years of soil formation and historic plant life and temperature and, and, and rainfall patterns ends up looking like this distribution of organic matter levels across the country. So you're all looking at where you farm, and if, if you're a lucky guy in the room, you're in that black spot in northern Iowa and southern Minnesota. Shame on you, you guys are spoiled. I don't even know why you need to be here, 300 bushel corn every year probably. So everybody else, you guys are doing what you need to to get to that level and work with what you have for soils. Organic matter across the country is basically a fingerprint of a thousand year history of the sustainability of plant life or the yield potential of that historic plant life that's been there for a long time. On a local level, within your field, why do we see variation of organic matter within our field? Well, the climate was probably the same, the historic plant life was probably the same, but it's that water. How did the field absorb and utilize the rainfall events that has happened in that field over the last thousand years before we farmed it? It has to do with the soil characteristics, the slope of the soil, the side hills, the, the, uh, the drainage, the depth of soil, the texture of the soil and its ability to absorb and retain the water. All of that drove the plant life before you farmed that field to produce what organic matter is there now. To me, organic matter represents, based on a very long-term history of development, the potential for yield in a zone and a field. You can't change what's happened there over the last thousand years. So now you have a fingerprint showing you exactly what that is. It'll tell you where the highest and lowest potential is. Organic matter represents the stability for that yield. So even if you have a very similar soil type, if it didn't have...
water retention, consistent water retention year after year, it might be a more unstable yielding zone. So all these factors add up to be within your field. That organic matter variation is a fingerprint for productivity and yield potential in your field. And our new Smart Firmer is a high resolution fingerprint that can give you an accurate map to identify where those zones are and to make it easy for you to start changing how you manage those different zones. So let's look at a field that we actually have, have done some work mapping organic matter with Smart Firmer. This goes all the way back to 2016. This is the first planter you're seeing run here that ever had the prototype Smart Firmers scanning the soil, giving us information in the cab about what the capability of that soil is. This, this drone shot very clearly identifies two different soil zones in the field running in down by Hayworth, Illinois. The map is not as pretty as what we develop, what we can produce today, but it's my favorite field story, so I keep it in here. Dale Cook always tells me, he says, we gotta get that map update. I said, no, I like this story. I like the story about this field and, and how clear it shows the definition of the zone. So you can see there's a little bit of streaking in the colors but it very accurately represented that one zone was 4% organic matter and the other zone was 2% organic matter after we planted the field. On the right hand side you see the satellite image. If you're lucky enough to find an old satellite image of your fields that it actually shows the bare soil color, um, it's a pretty accurate representation of the history of the organic matter development in that field and the representation of yield. And see how well the satellite bare soil image correlates to the organic matter map from Smart Firmer. This farmer gave us five years of yield data at that time. He's a corn-soybean rotation, so he normalized the yields between corn and soybeans. And then we compared the two zones to the field average over that five years. And so the 4% organic matter zone over a five-year average has produced 4.5% higher yields than the field average. The 2% organic matter zone has produced 3.5% lower yields than the field average. Doesn't it start to make sense that we can use this layer of information to drive our variable rate population scheme in corn or in whatever crop you're planting. This is a telltale sign that if I increase the population a little bit in that 4% zone, I'm probably in a good environment to get some yield back from that higher amount of plants. But yet in the other zone, I'm always lower yield compared to average, and I may want to back off a little bit there. Here's another data set. 2017, we had a whole bunch of farmers running Smart Firmer. This was, was closer to the final version that we're selling this year, and so we call it the beta year, and this is where we put a whole bunch of units out in the field, and you guys run them on your own farms. And so we had 58 fields in this data set. We represented seven states. We've got Minnesota, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Wisconsin, North Dakota, all represented in this data set where we correlated the organic matter level read by Smart Firmer and the yield that came from the combine. Notice how tight the trend line is. We've got an R factor of over 80%. That's a phenomenal data set even if you're a statistician when you're doing environmental research. I thought it was interesting. From half a percent to six and a half percent OM across this large data set, there was a 100 bushel yield increase uh, as we went from one end of the spectrum to the other. Per percent of OM increase added 16 bushels per acre is what this average turns out to be. So maybe it'll help you value some of the farmland you're looking at when you're, when you're pricing your cash rents and, and looking at land to buy. But it's very interesting how tight the correlation is to yield and OM. And I, I believe it's, it's, if you think about how did the organic better get there, what created it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Not only water, nutrients, and yield, but nutrition, fertilizer. What does the nutritional capacity by soil type, soil zone, or organic matter level mean when it comes to your crop? So back to that cation exchange capacity. This is a chart that shows from sands through loams and up to clays on the red bars. What you're seeing is the increasing capacity for storage and availability of nutrients. But then look at the organic soil on the far right, the green bar. Organic matter really kicks it up big time. And that organic soil, it's probably a 30 plus percent organic matter level. These are peats and mucks and how it's represented here, but just to make the point that organic matter plays a significant role in, this, in the exchange capacity for nutrients. For each 1% organic matter, you can expect, these are rules of thumb, 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So if you got 3% organic matter, you're gonna have 
60 to 90 pounds of nitrogen being fed to your crop during the season. Phosphorus, there's four to seven pounds of P2O5 per acre that can come per percent of organic matter. Sulfur is also another element that, that is uh, heavily released from the organic matter. So when you think about this, that organic matter map is, is a phenomenal guide to tell you the level at which free nutrients can be supplied from the soil. So it's another good layer to be thinking about on how you might adjust your side dress BRT nitrogen application. How do we get nutrients from the soil to the crop? Well, there's a lot of nutrients in the soil. What you see in this picture is you see some big flat plates. Those are considered clay lattices. They have the negative white charges on them. The nutrient elements bind to those negative charges. You also see nutrients bound to the organic matter that's in the picture, the, the brown squiggly lines. There is a lot of nutrients in the soil. 6,000 pounds of nitrogen can, can be in the top six inches of the soil you farm. 50,000 pounds of potassium. 3,000 pounds of phosphorus can be in the top six inches. If we've got this much nutrition in the top six inches of our soil, why do we even need to apply fertilizer? Well, because it's not all available. And we'll talk about when it becomes available later on. In solution, where the root actually gets a chance to absorb some of it, there's really only about 0.01% up to 2% of those nutrients actually in solution at any one time. This is heavily driven off of weather patterns and also your health of soil and one of your biggest tools in the toolbox to make the most available nutrients possible in solution is your microbial system. There's more microbes in one teaspoon of soil than what there is human beings on the earth. And this massive amount of microbial capability is what can feed your crop adequately during the back end of the season when our soils are warm and we've got adequate moisture. The number one thing you need to do to manage the microbes is to make sure your pH is balanced. If you let your soil slip into a five point something pH, less than 1% of that microbial population is now surviving and working for you. That's how sensitive the pH environment is. That's why if you go into a field that's got a five pH, you still see corn stalk or soybean or wheat residue from two, three, four years ago still in that field. You don't have the microbes and the, the biologicals there to break it down and create that cycle of available nutrients. So timeline through the season. This is what nutrient availability looks like. Remember, the microbes, soil temperatures, all this plays a big role in availability. So this orange line on here is representing a wave of available nutrients in soil solution. And the biggest dip is in the beginning of the season. You see the corn plants kind of in the background that represents the timeline of the season. Early in the season, what happens is when our soils first take a rapid warm up, our microbe population explodes in numbers. And they start frantically feeding on the carbon and the biomass that's in the soil. Well, microbes also like phosphates and nitrates and all of those things, so they become consumers and competitors for available nutrients that your corn plant or your plants also need. So the way we level the playing field so our crop never experiences a lack of nutrients is, is we put together our fertilizer program. And so our applied fertilizer is intended to offset the inconsistency of available nutrients from the soil itself. The most standard way that we apply our fertilizer is through broadcast form, the P and K that we put on in the fall. When you apply P and K in the fall, six months before you grow a crop, 90 to 95% of the nutrient material in that fertilizer goes into the soil and gets consumed and attached to soil particles and consumed by the microbes or a part of the organic material in the soil, and it ends up riding the exact same wave that the soil nutrients themselves do. So in season, what's left is about 5 to 10 percent of that applied fertilizer actually left in solution for the crop. So it's a very inefficient way to make sure that your plant gets what it needs. So really what we're doing is we're trying to build the soil levels to an excessive level where we've got luxury consumption of nutrients knowing that, or at least maybe you don't know, um, that a lot of that fertilizer is just being tied up in the soil and in the organic matter. So what does a broadcast program look like? When we manage our broadcast program, we're pulling soil samples, and the soil sample levels represented across the bottom of this graph is what we're looking at to, to put together our, our application rates. 
And so the agronomy handbook for most universities is going to guide you to build to a high level of, of soil test values. And then we're going to maintain that high level by applying at least the grain removal rate of our fertilizer um, that we're pulling off in the grain when we harvest. When you have banding in your nutrient management program, you don't have to build the soils to an excessive luxury level of fertility. You can shift it down to the medium range from the soil lab. And now your new build target is 25 to 30 percent lower than what it is to achieve the high level where all you're doing is broadcasting. See, there's a lot of efficiency gain as far as the nutrient you apply actually being available to the plant when you have some banding implemented in your system. And so now no longer do you need to build the soil level as high as what you would do in a broadcast program. So there's a significant, uh, significant opportunity for, for some savings there. So we've been doing a lot of banding and nutrients on the planter. We've got a couple of new products in the last few years where we've been learning about their opportunity individually out in the field. Um, the way I kind of have laid out the opportunity with banding versus broadcast of nutrients. This chart here is just one I threw together to, to get you thinking about it. The soil nutrient supplying power or potential is from low to high across the bottom, left to right. And then going up the left hand side of this graph is the amount of fertilizer that you need to apply to make sure that you get the highest potential yield. So if you have low fertility soils to the left, the difference between broadcast and banding applications the banding has as much as a 50% or more efficiency factor to generate yield by getting it into the crop versus just feeding the soil. If you've got medium soil test levels, it might be a 30% opportunity. But even in the really high fertility soils, there's still some amount, maybe 10% of efficiency that can be gained in banding versus a broadcast. So this might be a heavily manured farm or a farm that you have the levels built up very high over a long term of investing in fertilizer. So FurrowJet and Conceal are the products that, that we've been working with to ban some nutrients. FurrowJet was specifically designed for phosphorus. Phosphorus is a difficult element to get adequately into the plant because in the soil it's extremely tied up and extremely immobile. Phosphorus is a negative charge like the soil, so it doesn't hook to the soil, but it does latch very tightly to all the other positive charge elements that are hooked to the soil. So phosphorus is typically tied up. On the screen, the three smaller dots that are right near the corn plant, that's where FurrowJet places the phosphorus for maximum opportunity. It's immobile, so inches matter, and we've got to have it right where that plant needs it. Nitrogen, then, is where we put farther away from the row, the two larger dots on the screen. This is our Conceal product that's, that's new and in beta this year, and you'll learn more about Conceal in another breakout today, but just to get you thinking about the products that we have. In a little bit, we're going to talk about the test plots where I implement the use of those two products combined and we're going to compare the difference between nutrient management programs. We talk a little bit about nitrogen versus phosphorus. Nitrogen is an extremely mobile nutrient. It's in the atmosphere. We actually pull it out of the air that we breathe and we concentrate it. It goes into anhydrous first. We split that off into other forms of liquid and dry nitrogen forms. And so it's extremely mobile, both in soil, both in its cycle. So nitrogen, what we're trying to do is to minimize loss, but also make sure that it's available when the plant needs it. Probably the number one that everybody makes a mistake on is early in the season, during the immobilization period when microbes first fire up, it's very often that the nitrates are deficient as far as what's available to the plant. And this picture shows it well. When you have nitrogen deficiency, the corn plant changes shades of green very quickly and it's easy to see. So your nitrogen program, you're focusing on how do you minimize loss overall from the season? And of course, the plants aren't using any of it until they're actually growing. So anytime we apply nitrogen ahead of the season at any point in time, we're at risk a little bit of what the weather pattern might be until the plants are actually in the field utilizing that nitrogen. We don't know how much is going to make it. But number one is you want to focus on feeding the microbes and having enough left over for the plants to grow. And the key here is to have your applied nitrogen near the surface and near the plant's roots when it's that small. So a band of nitrogen with the planter or in the spring in, in a shallow form is really what's key to make sure that you've got that front end taken care of so that the microbes don't utilize all of it. And then the back end, this is about 
making sure you fill out the year. Whatever your yield potential is, you're going to subtract your soil supplying power, you're going to evaluate your ear count and stand count in the field, and you're going to adjust, and side dressing the bulk of your program is the way you should do it. So nitrogen on the planter is a phenomenal way to ban that nutrient early on so that the plant um, doesn't have, feel the impact of immobilization in the spring. There's always a risk of how we do it. And there's a lot of planters out there that are just dribbling out the back of the planter and the surface of the ground. So the last two years, we've done studies in the summer. After we get our plots in, we go out in our field out back and, and we're testing how mobile is the nitrogen, how much do we lose. So you see on the far left, there's a, a band being dribbled directly on the surface. Then there's a coulter next to that injecting it four inches deep. And then the row unit in the picture is applying it with our concealed product, which is about one inch below the surface. We built a soil probe, as you see in the room over here, to help us make it more efficient. Because to measure this, we want to measure everything in the soil as far as where is the nitrogen and how much has moved. So every week we would go out. And the first year we did it, we used a hand probe. And my interns had to probe every two inches across the band and we tried to measure about 15 inch wide band. This probe takes an 18 inch slice all at once, so we guarantee that we capture all of the nitrogen that was in the band, and it's also two inches thick, so we get a pretty good volume of soil to represent the sample each week as we pull these samples. So we open this up, we've got a nice slab of soil to work with, guaranteed that the band is somewhere in the middle of that. We then slice that slab of soil up this is in three inch squares. Each square goes in its own soil sample bag. We send it to the lab and we get a nitrate value and we get an ammonia value so that we know the total N that's in those squares. So after two years, this is kind of a summary of what we've seen for movement. So that time of year, um, this is typically a summer uh, program that we're doing. We haven't captured a lot of rainfall in the two years that we've done this. So this is fairly ro low rainfall amounts. And what you see there is about three inches each direction is, is where we've measured over doing this trial twice is as far as the nitrogen will move from a 32% liquid band. So if we're trying to target that young corn plant early in the season, um, it makes sense that a lot of our nitrogen application on the planters are two, three, or four inches away from the row. This means within about three weeks that that band will grow a little bit, the roots will find it, and we'll do pretty good. How much did we volatilize off the surface? So volatilization is a factor driven off of temperature and it's driven off of pH. So if you have high pH ground, it's worse. If we have higher temperatures, it's worse. So this test was done, excuse me, in the summer. We had about 85 degree weather and we didn't get much rainfall. And what we learned is, is after three weeks, the dribble on the surface lost 52% of its nitrate. Nitrate's only about half of that 32% liquid. So it's a total of about 26% of the nitrogen was lost. So volatility is a real thing. And we believe in applying your product that you bought, you paid money for, in a manner that is safe and it's going to be there for the plant. It can't produce yield if you lose part of it. And I don't believe in buying us, uh, an inhibitor or a stabilizer uh, because that's like buying insurance. So every year you've got to buy that stabilizer inhibitor. I don't think that's a long-term program that's going to have the best ROI. If you invest in an attachment that can inject the product in a safe place, you, you don't have to buy that inhibitor year after year or that safener. Phosphorus is a little bit different animal. Phosphorus, again, early in the season, is our biggest hurdle to overcome. And I think as far as farmers go, most of you spend more of your effort on the nitrogen management than you do on the phosphorus management. Phosphorus is very important to the plant. Phosphorus drives cell elongation division at the growing point of the roots and in the whorl, and it basically is what drives your plant's energy through ADP and ATP. And so during cell elongation division, as that plant is growing, phosphorus is driving that. It's one of the key elements. Early in the season, phosphorus is very hard to get a hold of. And it's critical time during the early development that it has an adequate amount so that it can get off to a good start. Phosphorus from the soil, whether you broadcast it on or you're just relying on what's in the soil, it's not even available until the soil is above 60 or 65 degrees. So we always have phosphorus inability to be available to the plant if our soil is less than 60 degrees. See, here in Illinois, 
We don't have very many guys running starter on their planters. Starter should always be considered a phosphorus product. So starter on the planter, not very common here, and that's because they don't think they need it. So I pulled the temperature data set. This is four inch deep bare soil temperatures from this season, 2017. April, May, and June across this chart. The blue bars represent the temperature range for each day of the month as we move across this chart. Only 30.8% of the time in April were the soils warm enough to adequately supply phosphorus to the corn. Only 58% of the time were the soils warm enough in May to adequately supply phosphorus to the corn plants. So that means roughly 42% of the time during the month of May when just about all of us have corn growing and developing the maximum size ear, we're starving into the phosphorus of it that it needs and it's not going to produce fully. And obviously in June the soil is warm all the time, 98% of the time we're above the level where, where phosphorus can be supplied. So now let's pull it all together. We put together some new trials this year and I'm kind of excited how this unfolds over the next few years where we want to compare systematic approaches to nutrient management. So what's the difference between just following the 40 or 50 year old agronomy handbook Rex, where we're trying to build the soil up to a high level and then maintain that through grain removal and broadcasting of fertilizers versus if you're banding and, and approaching and looking for a maximum efficiency opportunity. We are going to look at the economics and yield over multiple years. As long as I can keep these farmers uh, willing to let us work with them and, uh, and go on their farms and, and do some crazy things, we'll keep this going as long as we can. We're going to do weekly soil and tissue samples, so we monitor exactly what the nutrient availability is all season long and try to learn how efficient can we get our fertilizer investment. So I picked one field up by Morton, Illinois. It happens to be the lowest fertility field of the three that we're working with this year. And the reason I picked this is I've been shocked lately on how often I hear about the exchange of cash rent ground and you new farmers that pick up ground, you get a soil test done, and how poor the fertility levels are on some of those farms. So there's been farmers that are mining fields and trying to just basically steal some of the profit that's potential in that farm. They let it go when it's not doing as well, and then you pick it up. So what can you do to maximize your return on investment in some of these cash rent farms? And there will be some things in here that hopefully maybe stimulate some thought on how you manage that. So this field soil tested last fall in 2016 has a Bray P1 of a 6, 6 part per million. That's very low on a soil test scale. It has a potassium level of 1.5% base saturation. That's also low on a, on a soil test scale. The pH is only a 5.5 in this farm. The agronomy handbook says we need to raise it up to a 25 part per million Bray P1. We need to raise the base saturation of potassium up to a 2 to 3 percent. And we'd like to get the pH at a 6, 8, get our microbes working for us. So this is a tough farm. And I know some of you have either zones and fields or you've picked up farms that are similar to this. So what we did is we used our conceal and our furrow jet product to band nutrients in some blocks and then we've got broadcast P and K programs based on agronomy handbook recs across there. This field's got three replications of the same blocks. So on the far right there what we're looking at is a banding in season and I didn't know where to set the rate. So the concept here is if we're banding what's the maximum efficiency we can achieve. So I just picked grain removal at 200 bushel corn for the yield goal. And then next to that I added a potash build program based on the agronomy handbook. So it's actually 240 pounds of K or, or 400 pounds of applied potash. Next to that we're doing potash only, there's no banding. And then we're doing the PNK spread, so this is 400 pounds of DAP, 400 pounds of potash. This one is a fall spread of the DAP only, 400 pounds. Then nitrogen only, so this is our check for the field. All programs have the same amount of nitrogen. 240 units N went on. It's a luxury amount of nitrogen for a 200 bushel yield goal. And then we repeat. So what I really want to focus on is the systematic approaches. So nitrogen only being the check. And then in the center here, you can see what we put on for the in-season max efficiency removal only by banding liquids. 65 pounds of phosphorus, 40 pounds of potassium. And in the build program, it was calling for that 400-400 application. So that's 200 pounds of P205, 
240 pounds of K, all the same nitrogen. All the nitrogen was applied at planting time and the bulk of it was put on with a regular Coulter side dress rig. Look at these blocks in the summer. As we were scouting this field, this is June 27th. Significant difference in health, growth, vigor, consistency, where we banded nutrients in this field. July 14th, that significant difference in efficiently supplying nutrients to those plants through the band is really showing up as we're about to head into tasseling. And then during pollination, see on the left how consistent and uniform the tassels are in the banded block. Nitrogen only is in the center, it's way behind. And over to the right, we've got the 400 potash, 400 DAP applied, and notice how it's fairly inconsistent. But it's about timing-wise pretty close to where we banded, just not as consistent. So what happened to that 400 pounds of potash and 400 pounds of DAP consumed by the soil? Most of that got attached to the soil, and it's riding the microbial wave and availability wave in soil solution rather than staying available to the crop. So we can see that physically in the crop itself. Soil sample results. So every week we pulled soil samples. So the first set we looked at was last fall. Now these are weekly samples in season after the applications. So this is phosphorus bray P1. Agronomy handbook goal is to build to 25. The blue line there with the, with the squares, that's our build program from the broadcast. And you can see that we've got a few more years to go to get built up to where the agronomy handbook wants it, but it is higher than the other bands. A couple of weeks there, it was about the same, but once the soil started cranking on it and, and making it available, it moved. In a banding program, I'm recommending we build to the medium level. That's a 10 to 15 part per million Bray 1. And you can see that our banded application, which is the diamonds here, is not in the optimum range either. Now, when we sampled the banded block, I sampled off the band. And the reason is we've had a lot of trouble in the past sampling with soil probes on the band. And when the crop was growing, I couldn't get my good big probe out in the field, unfortunately. So we had to do it by hand. And um, I wanted to know, is there any change to the soil fertility as a whole in that block in the field anyway? So I'm not too worried about measuring the band there. So what you see is that the fertility for phosphorus Bray P1 is about the same as the nitrogen only block because we didn't represent the band. Now here's an interesting set of data here. This is water soluble test, which you can get in a lab. And in water soluble, it represents the nutrients that are actually in solution, which would be available to the roots of the crop. And notice how all three systems are actually about the same. So the water soluble test is telling us that that 400 pounds of potash, 400 pounds of phosph uh, phosphorus that we put on is not in solution. It's tied up in the soil like we thought. There's about a half to one part per million difference. Um, that those, again, the squares represent the high rate fall broadcast. So then we also pulled tissue samples all season. And you can see the square line, the line with squares on it is the broadcast. Um, so it runs just a little bit higher in the tissue most of the season. The optimum tissue levels are 0.3 to 0.4% phosphorus. And uh, our banded max efficiency grain removal only it's in there some of the time, but as we get in the back end of the year, we're just, we're just touching the bottom of the optimum level in the plant itself. So this data is telling me, well, maybe removal only in the band in this low fertility field might have been just a tick too low. And I wonder if we would increase that rate by 10 or 20% if we actually would have been equal to that high rate fall broadcast. So as we move through this, what we're going to learn about is how powerful was the efficiency of that low amount of banded nutrients. Here's the yield map. On the far right, we're lining up with our banded in-season block. You can see the color of the corn there. This is the yield strips from that. Fall K only with nitrogen is that red one. This green one is P and K together. Fall, fall P only, N only on that uh, screen there. <clears throat> Took the yield data from the center to combine strips only, and uh, here's the result. So the high rate of broadcast application did win the yield contest. So in this field, 225 bushel was the fall broadcast high rate. The end season, just 20 bushel behind, still raised 204 bushels. Nitrogen only is a disaster. And uh, surprisingly, I hear stories about guys cash rent and ground and they just put in only on and then take the yield from the field. Something interesting, and I'm not sure what to make of it. Wherever we put the potash, 
400 pounds of potash here on top of the nitrogen and there's no yield difference. Over here, 400 pounds of potash on top of our banding block, no yield difference. It's actually kind of an argument going on amongst agronomists and universities on what is the real value of potash and how, should, how aggressive should we be building and applying potash in the field. I didn't expect this. I've always believed in, in potash. Potassium in the plant is the structure of the plant. It's the health of the stalk. It keeps the disease out of the stalk. It moves nutrients through the plant. But maybe there's something to that 50,000 pounds that's available in the soil. Maybe it actually does a better job feeding the, the plant all season um, on its own. I'm not sure. I don't have a recommendation on changing your potash program, but I do think it's interesting how it didn't add much value. The phosphorus, on the other hand, when we added phosphorus, whether it was a low banding rate or the high broadcast rate, 60 bushel of the acre response over nitrogen only. What I'm kind of concluding from this year is if you got low fertility field and you really got to pinch pennies on what you invest in for fertilizer, don't back off on nitrogen and phosphorus. Phosphorus is very important. This is the cost per program. So the circles again are the N only, the in season crop removal banded, and then the fall broadcast build program. And you can see we spent $153 on the in season banded, $234. It's $80 more that we spent on the broadcast program. Now, <clears throat> if you're borrowing money for your inputs, I didn't add this in to the ROI that we're going to look at next, but there could be an additional cost to having to borrow an additional $80 an acre in a fertilizer program. So this is something that I didn't think about factoring in when I put these slides together. But the ROI, after we pay for the fertilizer and look at the yield that we created, is actually the highest in the grain removal only banded nutrients. $17 an acre more profit over the build program that we were putting on based on the agronomy handbook. And really the point here is that there's huge opportunity in banding if your investment in fertilizer is pretty high on your farm or on cash rented ground. The other point here is that I don't think I got a high enough rate in my grain removal only max efficiency bands and I think next year we might kick it up a little bit as far as the rate that we band in this field. The interesting thing is the efficiency of the phosphorus in these two different applications. So where we banded phosphorus for every pound of P205 we got a bushel of corn out of that. Where we broadcast phosphorus for every pound of P205, we only got a third of a bushel of corn. Huge difference in efficiency of that fertilizer investment creating yield. I've got some tips for you to take home as I wrap up here. The goal in your nutrient management program should always be to maximize yield while minimizing your fertilizer cost. And the way to do that is through understanding ways to apply to maximize the efficiency or the use of that fertilizer. Kicking up your soil test program. Most of us soil test on a four-year program in a grid soil sampling scenario. In my opinion, and I share this opinion with a lot of agronomists around the country, grid sampling is a waste of technology. Grid sampling is dumb use of that technology. I've never seen soil zones or yield zones in fields line up to squares in the field. And I think we should sample a lot more often, maybe every year or every two years, to really tighten in our fertilizer investment. Invest in lime. Lime is probably your number one opportunity in fertilizer because it gets the microbes working for you if you have acid soils. And basically manage for efficiency. Lowest hanging fruit that you could change on your farm if you're not already doing it is putting phosphorus starter on the planter to make sure that that plant has adequate amounts of phosphorus nutrients in the season early on and split applying your N is probably the other one. If high percentage of your N is going on before you even have plants growing in the field, consider a way that you can move more in closer to the in-season use of that product. And really what we're working towards at Precision Planning is we're focusing on how do we build the fundamentals it takes to get maximum potential out of every, every ear or maximum grain development out of every plant. And the foundation that we are building this off of is nutrients. Nutrition is the foundation for optimizing ear potential. And Bryce Baker's coming in now, and he's going to cover what's in the top end of this pyramid and where are there opportunities that you can also increase that potential. All right. Thank well, you. thanks, Corey. Um, welcome to everybody. Thanks for being here with us today at all of our, our different sites. And so we're going to talk about basically how do we finish out this pyramid as we build on top of nutrition because obviously we need to start with the foundation of nutrition, but nutrition alone isn't enough if we don't essentially get an ear on every plant. And so 
as we look at maximizing our yield, maximizing this ear potential, number one, we look at the number of ears that we have in every yield check. So you can see the two yield checks up here. The only difference tired, between the top all, line and that one. bottom line <laughs> is the number of ears that are there. Ear size is the same. So every ear in a yield check is worth about seven bushels. Then we look at when do we determine a maximum ear size. And really, maximum rows around is determined in that V4 growth stage. So we want to make sure the plant has enough nutrition, but also is in a good environment, the proper environment, and it's not under very much stress. In V6, maximum rows long are determined. So we also want to make sure at that time that nutrition is there, but also the environment. So let's talk a little more about the environment. Emergence is the second block. So we'll really talk about four things we need to do on the planter pass to make sure our emergence is very consistent. And so those things would be clearing the furrow, creating a furrow at the proper depth, maintaining the furrow until the closing system can then close the furrow. So let's walk through each of these things. So we start with clearing the furrow. We need to make sure that surface residue is managed with a row cleaner. So we can see here, we've got our precision planting ready row unit with a row cleaner on there. The question is, how do we manage that row cleaner? What are we trying to get it to do? Well, we're trying to get it to sweep away residue, but not soil. We don't want to plow and do tillage with the row cleaner. If we end up with residue hairpinned by the disc openers down in the trench, it's going to affect the temperature and moisture that the seed feels that's against the residue. It can also cause seedling blights from the toxicity that's given off by the breaking down residue. And also, Corey talked a little bit about nutrient immobilization. That can happen as well, where nutrients are not available to the plant because the microbes feed on the residue. And so, clean sweep is a simple tool that you can have on your planter, an air cylinder on every row, and you would simply adjust the pressure on the row cleaner to make sure it's doing the job we want it to, sweeping residue away and not moving soil. Once we've cleared the furrow, we need to create the furrow. And so we look at this picture, and, and many of us are gonna look at this and say, wow, that's very poor depth control. This is actually perfect depth control, 100% ground contact in this part of the field. This was a, a depth study. And so the problem here is actually where this handle was set. This was one and a half inches, planted into a stale seed bed, held consistent one and a half inches. But what about our moisture line? Is our moisture line a straight line? it varies under the soil surface. And so in this stale seed bed north of Kokomo, Indiana, some of these plants were in enough moisture to germinate, but the rest of them that you see that are very, very late actually didn't emerge until they had enough rain to begin taking in water and, and then emerge. So we see we gotta be below that moisture line. We gotta find the bottom of that moisture line. Creating the furrow and then maintaining the furrow, we gotta talk about planter maintenance. We can take all the technology in the world and put it on top of a planter that's marginal at best with maintenance, drive system, bearings, bushings, disc openers, gauge wheels, if those aren't all in tip-top shape, we're not gonna end up with the maximum ear potential we can have. So disc openers, proper contact point. Gauge wheels need to be tied against disc openers, slightly scrubbing so we don't get soil between them. If soil gets between them, we can have this phenomenon we see on the right. We look at that on the right and we say, hmm, there's a ribbon of dry soil in the bottom of the furrow. Maybe I need to go deeper, but is that really the issue? It could be, but if we look to the right and the left of that, we see darker soil. And actually in this field, there was, there was moisture. We were planting in moisture, but why did we have seeds sitting in dry soil? Well, you can see on the left, one thing that can cause that is the gauge wheels pitching that dry soil into the furrow right there with the seed. And this is gonna be a lot worse on a row unit that has slop in the gauge wheel arms or a gap between the disc openers and the gauge wheels. And here we'll see a video of how that actually happens in the field. What's interesting about this is that we actually noted this spring that when this happens and we get gauge wheels throwing soil in, Smart Firmer actually will pick that up in, in many cases. So Smart Firmer will have a reduced moisture reading and actually pick this phenomenon up. The point here is make sure that we've got our maintenance right. Another way that soil can get into the furrow dry soil can is with the furrow collapsing. So we see as the planter slows down here, you just see the dry soil collapsing into that furrow. So we look at this environment and say, how would we prevent that? Do we need to run more weight on the gauge wheels? Smash the clods down? Well, if we do that, we maybe prevent this issue, but we create compaction. What about using our row cleaners as tillage, setting them more aggressive and peeling away the top inch, the top two inches? What if we did that? That would remove this dry soil, but we could also have our gauge wheels running on a berm, which could compromise the depth we're actually seeding at. The actual answer to fix this issue in this case is a better tillage pass. If we're doing tillage and we say, ah, this tillage pass will dry out the soil for us so we can plant tomorrow, bad decision. 
That's what happened here, and we end up with this cloddy, dry, poor seed bed. Delta Force is a system that allows us to maintain gauge wheel firming force so we can maintain a furrow, and it also has the benefit of reducing compaction. So if we're maintaining a proper gauge wheel weight automatically on every row of the planter, we're also reducing compaction. And we see this plant on the left that was planted in an excessive downforce environment that had compaction. Now, that plant is going to have a smaller ear because this compaction is going to cause stress, and in V4 and V6 growth stages, setting rows around and rows long, that maximum will be reduced. So in a two-year study here that our parent company, Agco, has done, we see a 5.1 bushel advantage to running Delta Force compared to running an airbag system without any control that's running too heavy. So a significant impact there. Closing the furrow, the last thing we want to make sure that that row unit does well is close the furrow completely without air pockets. Make sure that we have good seed to soil contact so moisture and temperature is consistent among every seed. You know, this year I, I helped plan a number of plots um, with some folks at Agco uh, with the crop tour events. And when we made adjustments on the planter, most of the time we could see feedback. When we put in V-set discs that purposefully had skips and multiples on them, we saw our singulation go down. When we adjusted our downforce system to be too heavy and too light and correct, we saw changes in ground contact and margin. When we got a piece of silicone that got into a meter and wrapped around the singulator, we saw an issue with singulation. It dropped 5%. And when we did the closing wheel study where we actually, it was a closing force study, where we changed the closing force, what did we see? We didn't see anything. And it was frustrating the lack of feedback I had. It was even more frustrating two weeks later when I watched the GoPro video finally, and you see in this yellow circle, you see open trenches, just like we see on the right. And so there's a lot of opportunity for us as growers to make sure that we're doing the best job we can closing. It's an area we really need to focus a lot on. And you know, Smart Firmer can help us in all these different areas. And we were very surprised this year with our beta, beta growers, what we actually were able to find. Planner issues that Smart Firmer found. You know, Smart Firmer is not a, closing, not a closing sensor, and it wouldn't have found those open trenches. But when you see a map like this field view cab map, we see this planner had Smart Firmers on every single row. So every furrow was being measured. We had eyes in every furrow, and we can pick up row six had an issue, low seed germ moisture. Well, why would that be? We investigate row six, and actually, in this case, it was a closing issue that was found. A rock had become wedged in the closing system. It was pushing soil, and it actually lifted the smart firm up out of, this, out of the seed trench, thereby its moisture reading was reduced. Now, there's some real cost to some of these things. As you can see here, where this was occurring in the field, about a 90 bushel loss just from the plants that were gone. Right? And so smart firmer helped correct that issue, something we were actually really surprised that it found, a planter issue. What about residue distribution? So you can see in this picture here, we have inconsistent residue distribution across the field. So how, how does Smart Firmer and the clean furrow metric help us with that? So if we go up to the Dakotas, uh, Messer Farms up here had a field that basically there was a pattern that started occurring across the field. And we can see that very, very definitively because of the Rotoro -Roto Smart Firmer that we see. And so the dark green is a very clean furrow where we have the, the yellow and the reds, that's a dirty furrow. And um, Aaron Herman shared this story with me. And, and you know, Smart Firmer sometimes tells us we need to fix something right now, like the closing system, sometimes for the next field, but sometimes maybe it's not even the planter pass. In this case, the combine was not distributing residue consistently across behind the 40-foot draper head when wheat was harvested. It was actually, the spinners were actually throwing heavier residue to the outsides of the pass and less residue in the center. And you see how that's mapped out here. So it took a little bit to figure that out, but the, the answer to that is instead of the poly spinners or the poly paddles that were worn, putting steel ones on for the following season for more consistent distribution of residue. Aaron Herman, one of our agronomy um, folks, spent a lot of time up in Michigan, and basically what he did was a, he did 463 100 plant counts is what he said the actual number was. And basically he, he made this graph that correlated ear potential to clean furrow. So the yellow dashed line is the clean furrow number, and then the ear potential is what he measured doing these hand counts in those areas. And so you can see as clean furrow drops and we have more residue present in the furrow causing emergence issues, our ear potential goes down, which makes sense. So he put a few numbers to it. Found for every 1% based on these hand checks, every 1% drop in clean furrow, it cost about two and a half bushels. And so 
97% is really where he said, if we got below 97%, that's where we really start to, started to see quite a bit of yield loss. So if you just think about the difference between 97 and 90% clean furrow, just a 7% difference, based on this, that's about a 17 and a half bushel loss. And back to the Dakotas and Messer Farms, you see here the difference in ears between 98% clean furrow and 85%. And over here on the board here in Tremont, we have a 98% clean furrow ear uh, on the top, one one thousandth of an acre, 82% on the bottom. And you look at this, and you see we're about a 25 bushel difference between. And so we're excited for you to have smart firmers on your planners and being able to figure out, do I need to make a residue manager adjustment, or is it my combine that I need to improve, or am I doing a good job, or maybe in corn on corn situations, we'll change the way we incorporate residue into tillage. What about furrow creation? We think about how that furrow is created. Can Smart Firmer tell us in our operations anything about how well we're doing that? So you see here on the 2020, a uniform furrow reading, and you see in the bottom right, 98% on row three. And so uh, this grower had Smart Firmers on every row, but as some of us are probably guilty of, he said, ah, oh, it's first year beta product. That row is really, really high, kind of out of whack. I'm sure it's wrong, something's wrong with that firmer. 140 acres later, when our test engineer got there, he said, well, let's go check out that row. Found that the opening disks on that row unit were seized. Instead of rolling through the soil and creating a trench, they were seized, and the whole row unit was simply plowing. And it was plowing about three inches of soil out, and creating just a valley. And so the smart firmer was running in very, very moist soil, three inches below the surface is where it ended up. But as you can see in the picture on the right, the seed was being dropped right on top of the ground. And so some serious, serious emergence issues with seed on top of the ground, of course. And so we may think, how often do these planter issues really happen? Well, we don't necessarily have to admit it if we don't want to, but some people are willing to admit it publicly for the whole world to see, like you see in these couple Twitter posts from folks this past year. You know, and, and these things happen. You know, I was talking with a grower a couple days ago, and he said, yeah, I had a row cleaner wheel fall off, and it happened to be on a row that had smart firm, and I saw my clean furrow drop, and I found that the row cleaner wheel had fallen off. So these things do happen. So we're very excited about Smart Firmer now as, as a product available for you to have on your planter to start seeing, are we getting seeds in that moisture? Are we doing things as well as we possibly can? So with the control systems on the planter, with the maintenance that we've done, and with Smart Firmer's eyes in the furrow, we can make sure we're clearing, managing residue appropriately, creating the furrow at that proper depth so we're at moisture, maintaining the furrow, closing, which leads to consistent emergence. And that consistent emergence is that next block on the ear potential pyramid. And so we take proper nutrition, combine it with very consistent emergence, the tightest time window from the first plant in the field emerging to the final, add 99 plus percent singulation, very consistent spacing on top of that, and the right population in every area of the field, we're able to maximize the ear potential that we have of that planter pass we're already gonna make and we do it as well as possible.